uh, we're going to talk about skin disorder, which is very, very interesting. I like skin disorders. Uh, first, it should be easy points for you guys when you take the step one, because as long as you know what it looked like, then um, you sort of, you know, guess what it is. Uh, it's really straightforward. Uh, a lot of questions on the skin disorders, uh, they're not going to try to trick you or anything. Uh, you, so the only thing you need to know is what it looks like and what other conditions that is associated with the skin disorders. Uh, so that's the whole point of the today class. Obviously, you know, dermatology is a big field. Uh, there's a lot of other advanced stuff, but uh, for the purpose of, you know, step one, I don't think you guys need to know all of that. Just need to know the basic and then um, the really basic information uh, and it should be quick. Okay, so the objective today is we're going to learn about the key terms in dermatology and why do we have to know about the key terms. Um, so especially when you look at a patient and they have a skin rash or a lesion, you really know, you need to know how to describe the lesion so that when you call for a consult, um, they know exactly what you're talking about. Um, so generally, like, you don't want to say like, oh, I have a patient with a skin rash, like, can you come down and see it? Now, like, the dermatologist will ask you, you know, what kind of color, uh, what does it look like? So you need to know the, the right terminology so that when you call them, uh, they sort of have an idea, is it an emergency or it's not an emergency? Uh, so that's why you have to know the terms uh, in dermatology. And a lot of the questions in step one, uh, they will give you the characteristic. Uh, so it's sort of like drive you to the answer. So you need to know the key terms in a lot of conditions. Right, and the second thing is you need to know the structures of the skin, uh, and then risk factors, presentation, and histology for common skin disorders, uh, pigmented skin disorders, and then uh, blistering skin disorder, and other uh, you know other commonly tested skin disorders. Okay, so the very first thing I want you two guys to uh, sort of answer is match the correct definition with the uh, correct terms. Okay. All right, so let's see. All right, I'm gonna have. Uh, Hi, Tao. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, welcome to the class. So you're going to yeah. have the first pick, okay? So yes. I want you to tell me what is one. So a lesion less than five millimeter in diameter and it's usually flat and usually have a distinct which color from the surrounding skin. So how would you describe that lesion? Mm, I think it's the macune. Oh, wow. Okay. Did you watch uh, uh, the class? Okay, he talked uh, about this. No? Okay, <laughs> that's good, but that's fine. Okay, great. So good job. So you got the first one right. Uh, so go ahead, do the second one until you get it wrong, then we can go ahead with another one. So it's two. It's still you, Tao. So, so elevated dome shape with a lesion less than five millimeter. Tao, can you hear me? And yes, Tao. Yeah. So second one. So the first one is, you know, it's flat, right? So you call it a macule. So what it yeah. is elevated, like it's, you know, it's raised. So like when you run your finger across it, it looks like there's a, like a bum. So that's why it's elevated. What would you call it? Mm, I think it's, mm, I just guess it's. <laughs> okay, anyone else know? Uh, it's pa papin. Okay, so papio. Papio, yeah, yes. Yeah, so great, you know, you make a very good good guess, okay? So a macio is flat, yeah, papio is like a, a raise, it's like a, you know, so it's not flat yeah. anymore. So when you run your finger across this, the lesion, it should have like a, a bum, you know, you can feel like this elevated. Yes. Okay, so remember, so you always study uh, thing in pairs, okay? So a macchio is like a flat lesion, okay? A papio is like something that, you know, raised up, okay? Uh, good job. Uh, all right, let's see, Hong Wo, uh, your turn now. I uh, see flat lesion, uh, yep. more than five millimeter, I think it is uh, a patch. A patch. Okay, great. A patch. Okay, yeah. so a patch. All right. So when you uh, pronounce uh, English, make sure you pronounce the last word. Okay. So like ch, you have to call it a patch. All right. Try that. Yeah, patch. Okay. All right. So four elevated. Yeah, lesion, four. More than five millimeter across. Uh, black. Okay, great. So black. 
Uh, great. All right. So let's see. Um, all right. Well, all right. So let's see. Hip. You up next? Right. Yeah. So just matched five and six for me. Let me see. It's Greece. Oh, they have a purse. So that means it's a um, um, purse tool. Yeah. Right? It's a, yeah. So it's pus. So that's why. So easy to remember. Pus is, you know, it has pus in it. So pus drill. Okay. And six. Vesicle. Mm. All right. So anything that has fluid inside will be vesicle. All right. So here, uh, take it away. You can go ahead with the next slide. Okay. All right, so this is what I need you guys to remember, uh, not for the sake of step one, but for the sake of your <laughs> medical education, uh, especially, you know, in the future when you call for a consult, especially you hip, uh, when you call for a consult, you need to describe the correct lesions, uh, otherwise you're going to get yelled at. Yeah. So go, go ahead, um, tell, like, you know, go through the lesion and the description of it. So, um, like you said earlier, like we uh, need to um, uh, combine them with a similar, m m a similar morphology, right? So with the, um, so with the, the bowler, it's go with the vesicle. I think it's, it's better. So with the, um, because with the vesicle, they have the uh, fluids, free rise, lesion, let them uh, five, milli five milliliter. And bigger than that is bowler, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the excoriation, I have not learned about this yet, so I can't so, tell uh, Excoriation is exactly, it's just like uh, trauma related. So, you know, like um, the dice, you know, like dice, yeah. So it's just anything that breaks the skin, uh, then we call it excoriation. Um, so that's exactly what it sounds like. It's, yeah, like you know, you scrape your skin uh, like across like a, a hard cement, uh, then they call it the like, excoriation. Yeah. All right. Well, the, the next one is the uh, macula. So this one is the um, uh, flat lesion with well circumscribed chains less than five millimeter, and bigger than that is the patch. Right. It's a, also a flat lesion, but. Uh, variant five milli milliliter and um, nozzle nozzle is elevated lesion with a spherical contour right variant five milliliter across um, we already are uh, with the uh, paper so elevated dome shaped of flat topless lesion less than five milliliter uh, I already go over pads. So plaque is elevated flat top lesion, usually gradient five milliliter across. And um, pustal discretest uh, pus few rice lesion. And I have I don't know about the uh, scale. So scale is sort of like a dry, uh, you know, lesion that I have, you know, you can see the skin flakes on it. Um, so anything that most of the time you will not be able to see any dry skin, but if they look like scaly, if they look scaly, then you just call it scaly. Uh, so it's not very important. Okay. Okay. So, yep, so vesicle is basically anything that will have fluid fill in it. So what I want you guys to know that the difference between the macchio and the papio, okay? So uh, a macchio is basically, it's a flat region. So like when you run your finger through it, if, if you don't see any bump, then you cause a macchio. And then you measure that, okay? So just eyeball it, you know, nobody's gonna measure exactly five millimeter, but it looks small, then you cause a macchio. And if you see there's a big patch, then you cause a patch, okay? and then. If there's elevation, then you can think about, is it a nodule, is it a papio, or is it a plaque? Uh, a nodule, usually, uh, when something is spherical, then we call it a nodule. Uh, so usually we don't really measure like exactly five millimeter. Uh, we just say that, okay, this looks round and it's elevated, we call it a nodule. Uh, papio is same thing, elevated lesion, and a plaque is basically like a bunch of things that come together, then you call it a plaque. And if you see pus in it, then you call it a pustule. Uh, and if you don't see pus, but you see a lot of fluid inside, then you cause a vesicle. Okay, so that's just a way how to keep everything straight. 
All right, so uh, this is exactly uh, what I want you guys to know. See, see this? So this is a MacGill versus a patch. Uh, so as you have to, you know, sort of differentiate it by the size. Uh, so MacGill is usually less than one centimeter or, uh, you, you know, like five millimeter. So that's why I say people don't usually measure it. Just know that if it's small, then you call it MacGill. If it's large, then you call it a patch, okay? Um, and then the second one would be between a papio and a plax, uh, same thing. Papio and a plax. The only thing that differentiate between them is the size. So you only see like a discrete, uh, you know, area. Then you cause a papio, and but you see a bunch of things that you know like clump together. Then you call it a plax. Uh, so make sure you sort of remember uh, that. All right. And so this is a nodule. So you can see that's a little nodule. Uh, this sort of looks like a round, you know, elevated lesion. Uh, so Usually that's how people cause a nodule, and one is has some pus in it, then you cause a pustule. Right. So vesicle is the same thing, but usually it have a fluid inside. So you can see you can see like fluid underneath that uh, you know vesicle, and um, you can tell. Uh, and bola, which is very characteristic. Uh, so the only difference between bola and vesicle is the size. So usually uh, vesicle is very small. Uh, for example, in herpes zoster, you can see like multiple uh, small vesicles. Uh, sometimes they can clump together. Uh, but in bola, it's like an elevated. It's a big um, pouch that you can see it inside. Uh, so most of the time, it could be uh, fluid. It could be serous uh, fluid. It could also be blood. Uh, so you call it a bola. All right, and uh, pay attention to the word uh, bola because it's mean, it means something when you cause a bola, especially with the uh, blistering skin disorders. Uh, some of them will have the differentiation. Uh, so it will tell you whether it's a um, you know, the uh, pemphigoid uh, vulgaris versus uh, the other one. Okay, so remember the word uh, vulgaris, okay? Uh, so hip, um, you wanna go to the three uh, main layer of the skin? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, do we have a slide for that or no? Okay. You're right there. So, uh, we have three main layers, right? So, the, um, the first, the up but on, on the top is the epidermis. The one in the middle is dermis. And the, um, the, the bottom one is hypodermis. Mm -hmm. So, with the epidermis, we have uh, three layers. Um, so um, that's, we have three layers from the epidermis. So it is called um, um, stratum conium, stratum lucidum, stratum uh, granulosum, uh, uh, stratum sabinosum, and stratum bicellus. So uh, I think uh, the most important uh, layer is the, um, the last layer, the strat uh, stratum bacillus, because that's like uh, is the concern, contain the uh, Melanocyte stem cell, and that that stem cell will differentiate into the um, uh, keratinocytes, and they also have the hemidesmosome. Hemidesmosome is charged to connect between epidermis and dermis layer. Um, with idem with idermis is uh, they have the fib fibroblasts and contain collagen type one and three. Uh, vitamin A upregulate collagen synthesis. Um, one of the interesting I know about the dermis is the UV light damage the collagen. So that's why you have a, a wrinkle when you when you age. Mm. And um, for the hypodermis, that the dermis is um, a lay up the fat and blood vessel in the hypodermis. Okay, uh, great. So. All right, uh, go okay. ahead and go through the five layers of the epidermis. Okay, so first I wanted people, uh, let's go back and I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the three layers. So um, the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. So when you look at the name, it tell you exactly what it does. So epi, anything that have epi means above uh, or next to it. And then dermis is like the main layer, uh, which is most of the connective tissue. And hypo, hypo means that it's below. Uh, so mostly uh, hypodermis is mostly just containing fat and it's not really important. Uh, so remember the dermis uh, above the epidermis and then below is a hypodermis. 
Okay, so the uh, in terms of the epidermis, which is the most important layer, uh, I want to talk about the epidermis a little bit. Uh, so in our skin, uh, we have five layers, but um, we also have thick and thick skin and thin skin. So if you look at the skin on your face and the skin of the uh, your palm, your sole, and palm, your feet, they are very different because one of them is thick, right, and some of them. Uh, on your face is really thin. So let's say if someone like punch you in the face, you can feel pain right away because it's really thin. But if you, some, sometimes, you know, some people that have their feet is so uh, thick that sometimes even they walk on like glass uh, or uh, sort of, you know, a sharp thing, they don't feel a thing because of the skin is so thick it uh, prevents any damage that go into the nerves. Uh, so that's why they don't feel any pain. So the only difference between the thick, thick skin and the thin skin is a layer, it's called the stratum uh, lucidum. Um, and we can talk a little bit about the stratum lucidum. Uh, so that's the only difference between the thick skin and the thin skin. All right, so uh, uh, go ahead and walk through the five layers uh, of this uh, epidermis. Okay, so I would like to uh, go from a bottom to, to, to the top. So yeah. with number five, right? Mm -hmm. that, that is the, uh, the deepest layer. And this layer is called um, contain the um, melanocytes, and we know melanocytes they will secrete uh, melanin, and melanin is the uh, skin pigment. So whether you have a dark skin or light light skin, it is um, due to the uh, melanin, and it also uh, contain uh, stem cell, and the stem cell will differentiate into the keratinocytes. size. And they also have the hemidesmosome. In, in the uh, in the step one, we have to know about hemidesmosome uh, because it's uh, it's associated with the auto um, auto, auto antibody again the hemidesmosome, uh, and that's called the bolus um, pamphigoid. And um, more upward is the uh, uh, stratum spinosum. So this uh, layer they contain the um, desmosome and um, keratinocyte. We uh, we have to know about desmosome because desmosome is a connect um, is a um, junction between the um, uh, epidermis layer or the keratin uh, keratinocyte. So we also have the antibody to again the desmosome and try to separate the epithelial cell and that's called that disease is called Ben figures um, for gavis. Move up to the um, number three is the stratum um, granulosum. Granul this is contain contain granul granul side or granul cell. Uh, that's also called the uh, keratin. Uh, ker that also called the um, keratinocytes. And in this side, they have a granule, so that's why like they, the name is called granulosum and moving up number two and number one is because um, from from this number two and number one they the um, create uh, the, this, this cell is going to die and they lose the nuclei and they get flat and uh, they get the uh, slough off yeah so uh, number two is the uh, stratum lucidum and number one is stratum conium. And as um, uh, Anhung uh, you said earlier, at the palm and the sole, at, at the, um, the palm of the hand or the sole of the feet, we have the uh, stratum lucidum. That's the only two locations we have stratum lucidum, but our face or another area in the body don't have uh, stratum lucidum layers. At the uh, stratum conium, that is the death the dead cell just you know like when you take a shower and you you see the dead skin is uh you can slough the skin off from the surface okay. yeah i'm done yeah that's great uh so uh like uh hip say earlier i think i want you guys to know the difference between the heavy desmosome versus desmosome so if you imagine ourselves uh you know like little round cell here they are connected to each other uh, by desmosome, okay? Uh, and then they are connected to the basement membrane through the hemidesmosome. Uh, so that in the other blistering skin disorders, depend on where the antibodies attack, uh, they give it a different characteristic of the disorders. Uh, so that's why you need to know 
desmosome is connecting between the cells together. Hemidesmosome means that it's connected to the basement. Uh, so just remember uh, that part. And then the other thing that I want you guys to remember is basically the name uh, of this layer. So the funny thing is that the, the way they name this, uh, the layer is actually helps you to memorize it. Uh, so you don't have to sort of memorize a lot of things. So for example, uh, stratum base cells. So this is a base when, you know, like the base means that it's at the bottom. Uh, and then usually you want to know that the stem cell and the melanocyte are usually in this layer. Okay, so when the skin is shed, uh, the uh, stem cell would divide and differentiate it into melanocyte and then they push it up top and as it move up top, uh, it will die and then uh, it can keep getting shedding. And then spinosum, uh, look at the name, spinosum. Spino means is spine. So that's why when you look under the uh, microscope, these gonna look like spiky, spiky cells. So that's why they call it a spike cell. And granulosum, basically it just have granules. Uh, when you look under the microscope, you, you can tell that it have a little bit granule on, on the inside, so that's why. And the top layer uh, will have the corneum and the lucidum. Uh, basically these are just dead keratinocyte and it's provide that you know, a mechanical protection and water loss uh, in our body, okay? Uh, so uh, the most important thing that I want you guys to walk away with this is the location of the hemidesmosome, uh, which is in the basement, okay? And then uh, the uh, desmosome, which is connecting between the cells uh, with each other uh, together. So it's, it's in between the cells. All right. All right, so let's see. Um, let's see. Can go to the next one. All right, so uh, the way that we remember the five layers is we always have mnemonics uh, to sort of help us remember. Uh, even though, you know, like the name is say a lot, uh, but sometimes you just need to know that first uh, thing to sort of help your memory, uh, as, you know, uh, recall uh, what layers, what layers. So one of the mnemonics that they put in first eight is Californians like girls in spring bikini. So like California is a very sunny state, so that's why you have the sun. Uh, you know, the sun, so it tells you about the skin. Uh, so that's why you remember C for corneum, L is lucidum, uh, granulosum, uh, and then spinosum and then uh, bacilli. Uh, so just remember that. So they go from up top to the bottom. Uh, some, some other mnemonics, we go from the bottom to the top. Whatever it makes you remember the layer is uh, good. doesn't matter. All right. Uh, so I want, so with in the five layers, we also have four cell types, okay? When I first started learning about the skin, it was very confusing to keep it straightforward. But remember that the epidermis have five layers and it, it have four cell types. Uh, so, um, uh, Hip, you want to go through the four cell types? Yeah, so um, we have four cell types. The first one is the 80% of the cell in that's called uh, keratinocytes. Uh, file, you know, like, they form the keratin. Um, and the, third, the second one is the um, uh, melanocyte. So this we know earlier is the, um, they will secrete uh, melanin, and melanin is used to uh, uh, help our body to uh, pro pro get a protection from UV light. And depend on the amount of melanin, we can have uh, light or dark skin. Uh, Langer hand cells. So Langer hand cells it is the um, I consider Langer hand cell is like a uh, macrophage. This is a this is a macrophage. It's, it's, it has something to do with the Im immune response and um, immune response and the uh, uh, muscle uh, the muscle cell. So this cell has something to do with the uh, touch re receptor. So it involves to the uh, nervous it go to the nervous system uh, when you um, you know like have a feeling on your hand. Yep, that's it. Okay, uh, so let's go a little bit uh, deeper into the melanocyte. So this is the most important cell when we talk about skin disorders. So I want you guys to understand that melanocyte, the main function to provide melanin, and also when it produces the melanin, it transfers it to the keratinocyte uh, in order to give the color. So that's why uh, each one of us have different colors of the skin. Um, so some of us are darker than others because of the amount of melanin. So, uh, you know, um, white people versus black people have the same number of melanocyte, but they have different amount of melanin, okay? Uh, so let's see, Hongbo, uh, tell me how does tannin works? How, why do you when you go into the sun and all of a sudden your skin becomes darker? 
What what happened? Yeah, I think because of the UV light will damage the the skin, so uh, mm -hmm. the uh, adaptation of uh, of the skin will increase the the um, the the the, mel me the melanin. Uh, the the, the oh, side we increase the uh, the melanin so exactly. the melanin will uh, make the, our skin become more darker. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, so exactly like you say, so UV light will stimulate uh, the melanocyte, uh, basically the stem cell within the base of our skin uh, to produce more, uh, you know, melanocyte and more melanocyte mean that they produce more melanin and our skin become darker. It's sort of like a mechanism for our skin to protect. Uh, you know, and the damage from the UV light. All right, so let's see. Tao, I know you guys use a lot of cream, you know, a lot of Korean now uh, uses the, you know, the whitening skin cream. So how does that work? What exactly happened when you put the cream on your face? <laughs> you actually, have to know, right? I Actually, I don't know the mechanism. Okay, you don't have to know the mechanism. I just so, okay. Yes, I just ill because the uh they a big <laughs> so so you buy the cream right and i tell you oh this this cream is gonna make your skin look beautifully white so yeah yes. so you just put it on your face and you don't know the mechanism <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right okay so uh tell me why do our skin how can our skin become whiter tell me what can you if you are the person yeah. making the drugs right making the cream yeah. What would you target in order to make your skin whiter? Are you targeting the melanocyte or are you targeting the melanin? Uh, I think it's the, um, because um, it reduced uh, melanocyte. Okay, so you, you, you targeting the melanocyte. So, all right, let, let me put it this way. Do you need melanocyte in our skin? Yes, of course. Because okay, so you uh, need it, right? You need the melanocyte, right? Because it's how you know, prevent our skin from, uh, yeah. first, it, it gives rise to the, the, the you know, the melanocyte is important because our skin keeps shedding. You need a normal function uh, melanocyte in order to have a normal skin, right? So I yeah. think it's a better choice to reduce the amount of melanin instead of attacking the melanocyte, right? So, you know, if you can leave the melanocyte alone, but you can reduce the amount of melanin, then your skin become whiter, right? Yes. Okay. So that's what how the uh, whitening cream works. Uh, so they work by basically prevent the mel uh, the melanocyte to produce melanin, or oh. it could also reduce the amount of melanin. Uh, so you know melanin can be broken down. You know, for example, right? I can go to the under the skin under the sun, and my melanocyte would produce a lot of melanin, right? Uh, so that way, I was, my skin become darker. But then if I go inside my house, uh, there's no more sun anymore. But you know, that's melanin is still there. So my skin should be dark for forever, but no, uh, that's not how it works. So the melanin can also be breaking down by our cell. Uh, so sometimes, uh, so it fuses with the lysosome and it breaks down the, uh, the melanin. Uh, so that's why my skin is dark and then it becomes a little bit lighter. Uh, but again, I have a certain baseline of a melanin. So that's why can, my skin can never be you know, white. It's always gonna be the same color like that unless I bleach my skin, unless I attack the melanocyte, like what you did, right? If I kill all my melanocyte, then my skin will be like pale and white, but very different. It looks, uh, it looks very different. So there are some conditions, skin disorder, that you can have a white skin, and then next to it, it's like a black skin, so it's different, okay? All right, so good job. Thank right, you. I'm gonna go to the next one. All right, so pigmentation, now we come to the important part, right? Uh, so this is how we, this is how skin product, uh, you know, is making a lot of money. So like I say, melanin is produced by melanocyte. So uh, let me just point it out over here for you guys. So this is, this is melanocyte. Look at this, this cell right here. So it's really how, it's, see how it's, it's black because of all the melanin that is produces all this melanin over here. And what it does is that it keeps producing the melanin. Uh, so this is melanin over here. And then it will transfer this melanin and it will, you know, transfer all this into uh, the keratinocyte. And all the cellular vesicle, all this vesicle, they cause a melanosome. All right. So like I said before, uh, how does the antenna work? Uh, basically, it stimulates the melanocyte, produces more. 
And uh, the only difference between a black, a black skin and then a white skin is that it just have more melanin. Uh, we have the same number of melanocyte, okay? It doesn't mean that you have darker skin, that means that you have a, a more melanocyte versus a, a pale person. Uh, we all have the same amount of melanocyte. Just a different of the melanin that causes the, the skin to look different. All right, so now we can talk about the pigmented skin disorders, okay? So this is the three most common uh, skin, like, you know, pigmented skin disorders, so which you have to remember. Uh, very easy point. Uh, they do ask you this on step one. So uh, Hip, uh, walk us through the uh, difference between them. All right, so uh, the first one is the uh, urbanism. So the urbanism, the main problem, it has to do with the, uh, the absence of reduced melanin production. So it uh, has something to do with the defective enzyme um, tyrosinase because we need the tyrosine convert to uh, melanin. So the enzyme convert tyrosine to uh, melanin, it tyrosinase and that enzyme is defective. So we reduce the uh, melanin uh, production. However, remember the uh, melanocyte is a, it's a still have normal number. So when you have the uh, low uh, number of melanin, melanin, you can, you know, like you can easy to damage by UV. So that's why you increase the risk of skin cancer. Um, the number two disease is the uh, uh, vertigo, and this this disease is because um, the autoimmune destruction of the uh, melanocytes. So that's why you can see um, uh, number. So that's when you see at the picture C right here, right? You you see that's one like a finger right here. They don't have a like they completely white. Because why? Because they don't have um, uh, me me melanin, and because we don't why, why we don't have melanin because we don't have the uh, melanocyte to uh, make uh, melanin. And number three is the um, uh, melasma. And this one is the, I think it is a hyperpigmentation, I, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Hyper, yeah. It's hy yeah, it could be, yeah, it could be hyper or hypo. Uh, oh, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So in, in this case, it usually happens in the uh, uh, pregnant woman or, or the um, oral contraceptive use because it, it has something to do with the estrogen, I think. Yep. Yeah, you're right. So the you know the first thing is melasma. Uh, basically, usually when you see a pregnant woman, they will have these freckles. Uh, you know, automatically you say what is going on. So this freckle is basically because of the uh, estrogen or the hormones in our body it changes the way it's melanin is produced. So uh, that's why it's not very uh, dangerous. You know, when you're done with a pre uh, pregnancy, some of them will go away. Sometimes it can you know linger a little bit, but most of the time it will resolve by itself. Uh, but it's like this freckles is, you know, just appear out of nowhere. Uh, but the most important thing that I want you guys to differentiate is albinism versus vitiligo. Okay. So when you, if you look at C, you can see that the contrast between the two color, right? One of them is just black. The other one is completely white. So you look at the skin and it's like completely white and it's uh, sort of like, you know, uh, it's very different than you think about, uh, you know, uh, autoimmune destruction. So vitiligo means that autoimmune. So when you read step one, when someone tell you that, you know, the patient have vitiligo, automatically think that they have some sort of autoimmune, uh, you know, underlying problem. And when you have autoimmune, they target in the melanocyte. Uh, they not target in the melanins. So that's why you're completely pale versus black. And albinism is the same thing. Uh, but think about the melanins being pre uh, reduced, not the no number of melanocytes. So make, make sure you know the difference between uh, albinism, albinism versus vitiligo. Okay, one affecting uh, the number of the melanocyte, the other one affecting the number of the melanin. Uh, and just know that albinism is uh, increasing the risk of skin cancer because you have less melanin protected the you from uh, your skin from UV light. Okay, uh, so we're gonna go to the next one. So that's a pigmented uh, disorders. Uh, so pigmented disorders have to do with the epidermis because they have to do with the uh, melanocyte versus melanin. Okay, so now we are done with epidermis. Now when you go to the dermis, uh, here, go take it away. All right, so uh, the dermis in the, the uh, second lane, in, in this lane we have contained a lot of connective tissue 
and with the uh, um, we know what the connected the connected tissue is composed of collagen, um, elastic fiber, and uh, so that's why we have a uh, fiber fibroblast. Fibroblast is made in collagen, and they also have um, macrophage or mast cell. And uh, it's um, you know it's also contain a nerve or glands or hair follicles, contain uh, blood uh, vessels. And uh, in this derm is they divide into two layers. The first layer is the uh, papillary region, and um, the um, the uh, so because like this uh, layer is uh, they look like um, uh, fin uh, finger like pro uh, projection. And um, there is uh, this layer they have that contain the um, masonal corpuscle, so this responds for touching and uh, free up ending for sensation of touch. And the, the second layer is the reticular region. In this one, they have the dense, irregular connective tissue contain collagen, electric fiber with sweat gland, fat, hair follicle, and they also contain uh, many nerves for pressure and vibration. Okay, uh, that is correct. So you just need to know that the connective tissue layer is called the dermis, uh, and this is how our, you know, skin can feel and can uh, sense, you know, other things outside. Uh, just remember that the macrophages, the mast cell, is contained in this layer, and uh, just remember that the uh, corpus go for touch uh, and also pressure and vibration is in this layer. Okay. All right. And next one is going to be, all right, so when we talk about the dermis, uh, now we can talk about the blistering skin disorders. So uh, in general, when we talk about blistering skin disorders, we can differentiate between, you know, uh, four sort of main categories. So I like to break it down by pairs, okay? So pemphigus vulgaris uh, versus bolus uh, pemphigoid. And then we have the dermatitis hepatiformis, and then we have the arrhythmia multiforme. And then four, which is the SJS or Stephen Johnson syndrome versus T. And uh, so this is very severe. And then we have to differentiate between them. Okay. So let's go through them one by one. And you need to, uh, I think it's better for you guys to study it by pair because these uh, most of the time uh, are, you know, sort of like very similar to each other, but have a little bit of difference. Uh, so make sure you know which one is which. All right. So let's talk about the uh, pemphigus vulgaris versus bolus uh, pemphigoid. Okay, here, go ahead. Okay, let me see. Um, okay, so let's do the um, we go with the um, Benfigus vulgaris. Mm -hmm. So, this happened in a um, younger patient and it's involved the uh, mucus um, membrane. And then they have the auto, um, auto antibody, they again the uh, um, desmoglin and desmoglin they, uh, they stay in the uh, desmos desmosome in the uh, layer of the um, uh, stratum spinosum and uh, they can you know like when the antibody uh, try to uh, you know like try to uh, attack that desmosome so they will have a a leak or uh, the interconnection between the layer is uh, not connected so that's why they can form a blister so that this blister they can describe the um, flaccid and rupture easily. So when you whenever you can you know like, touch touch your hand on a blister and that uh, blister rupture, they call the um, Nikoski. Uh, how do you pronounce this one? The Nikoski. The Nikoski. Yeah. Uh, yeah Nikoski positive, and uh, they have a poor pro pro prognosis. In a contrast with the uh, Bolus um, pemphigoids. This one is happened in the older in gray, but uh, it's also very similar. The antibody again to the hemidesmosome, and you know the hemidesmosome is try to uh, uh, connect it with uh, epidermis and epidermis. So that when you don't have the connection between epidermis and um, dermis, they will have a blister. The water can can get into that area and they cause tense and firm and uh, when you uh, but it contrasts with the uh, pemphigus of vulgaris this one have the native uh, nicosia 
because when you touch in a blister, the blister is not easy to rupture. And um, yeah, I think that's it's all I know. Okay. All right, Lo. So let me ask Kong Vo. Uh, yes. Yeah. So tell me how would you remember Polus pemphigoi? How would you remember the characteristic of Polus pemphigoi? So let's break down the word, right? Bolus, what does it remind you of? The name? Yeah. Um, it's, it's like a physical lesion, but more than uh, uh, five um, millimeter. It's yeah. A big, yeah. So it's big a vesicle. Yeah. So it's a big vesicle, right? So that, that if you look at the skin and it has this characteristic of a vesicle filled with fluid, but it's so big, then you call it a bolus, right? So bolus pemphigoi means that it just have a lot of bolus. And then if you, Try to remember whether the bolus pemphigoi attack in the hemidesmosome versus the desmosome. How would you remember that? Yeah, I just uh, I just uh, heard the uh, about one. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, you can see my marker, right? So what is this one? What is this? He hemidesmosome. So hemidesmosome, which is at the basement, right? Yeah. Right. Let's say if I have fluid coming in to this, right? Let's say you have, uh, let's say this attachment right here is broken. That means that the whole cell up here will go up, right? And you fill it fluid, right? Underneath here. Do you think that this cell will, you know, will break apart? This two cell over here will break apart? No. Exactly. So that's why it's, they cause tense and firm. Because even though there's fluid underneath, the attachments between the cells are still intact. So that means that, you know, like you have a lot of fluid, but it's not going to break. The skin is still intact. So it's not going to break. So that's why it, they call it tense and it's firm. Uh, that means that, you know, even though there's a lot of fluid, there's no breaking in the skin. However, in the, uh, you know, uh, pemphigus vulgaris, what happened is that between this attachment, between the two skin, uh, between the two cells are break apart. So that's why if you feel fluid underneath it, it will leak right through and it go outside. So that's why it's a little bit, it's flaccid and it's ruptured easily. Uh, so that's the only thing that, you know, difference between the two. So a lot of time when we study all this, we try to remember things, but if you can understand the, you know, the underlying mechanism, it's easier for you to remember instead of try to memorize it, okay? So understanding is very different from memorizing. But if you want to remember it, uh, they have a great mnemonic for it, you know. So uh, BAM, which is like swear word uh, in English, uh, they cause a vulgar word. Uh, so vulgaris is DAM. So you think well, vulgaris means it's attacked the desmosome. Uh, acantholysis means that it's a Nikolsky positive. Uh, that means that when you cut, you take the skin and you push it a little bit, the screen will scrape off right off it. So it will slough off from, your, uh, from the skin. And then we also have the mucosal lesion and then Mikoski positive, okay? So make sure you know the difference between the two uh, because these are so commonly tested. Uh, I can attest to you that they, I have uh, a few questions on my step one about this one. Uh, highly tested on the exam, okay? All right, so we're gonna go to the next one. So uh, same thing, so uh, you know, beside that the characteristic look uh, on the skin Okay, they can also stain uh, with you know fluorescent. Make sure you know the pattern between the two uh, so that uh, you can tell which one is which. Uh, so basically, when you stain it with the interfluorescent, uh, remember the bolus pemphigoi is attacked at the basement, right? So that's why that's why uh, you have this this right here. The whole skin is lipped up. Okay, so there's no. Um, you know, there's no net light. It's basically the whole skin is lift up. So that's why you have this like a linear, uh, like right here, it's just a, sort of like a linear deposit of antibodies. All right, so it's attacking the basement membrane. So you see it's how linear over here. Yeah, okay, versus the, uh, uh, you know, the pemphigus vulgaris, uh, it's attacking the attachment between the two cells. So you think about the cell over here, so it will attach this cell, attach this cell, and then you have another one up here, so attach it here. So that's why it's sort of like around the cell. So that's why you have this sort of like net light, you know? So when you see the pictures, it looks like a net light. It's not like a straight line over here. So if they give you a picture of the IG, uh, you know, uh, deposit, it looks like this. And think about uh, Pemphigus vulgaris, okay? Make sure you know that uh, the difference between the two. So this one is along the basement membrane. 
and the pemphigus vulgaris is sort of like a net light intracellular, uh, so in between the cells, okay? Highly tested, make sure you know this. All right, so the next disorders is we can talk about dermatitis and happy teformis, all right? So uh, to ta ta uh, let me ask you first, okay? So before you even, uh, you know, have any, know anything about this, this, this uh, disorders, I want you to break down the name for me. So dermatitis, what does that mean? Tao, can you hear me? Sorry, yeah. sorry. Oh, okay. I, I turn off the, yes. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the inflammation of the skin. Good, okay, so break it down. So dermatitis means inflammation of the skin. All right, so herpes teformis. All right, so just break it down. This, what does it remind you, herpes? Yeah, her, it's uh, caused by herpes virus. Okay, herpes so have you yes. seen a herpes virus? Uh, of course, I, I, I don't see, mm -hmm. I didn't see herpes virus because mm -hmm. it's very, very small. Okay, so, yeah, I know. <laughs> have, you, have you seen it in real life? Anyone, what can you mm -hmm. tell me, what a condition, like a common condition that caused by uh, a herpes Jingo, virus? Jingo. Jingo is one, okay. So what, what about the other yeah. one? You know, when you were you, um, you a kid, uh, they have chicken pop. Chicken pop. Okay, right. uh, how about on the lips? I'm telling you, so this is the lips. Yes, uh, it's like um, um, a lip. It, yeah. mm, I, I see this, but I, see I don't know the okay. name of um, this disease. So uh, in, in English, we call it cold sore. Uh, so it's like a cold sore, okay? So cold? Uh, yeah, cold oh, sore. Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, remember herpes infection, it's a little vesicle, right? Small vesicle very tiny vesicle, okay? Yes. And when you break down the name herpes teformis, mean that it's a formation of a bunch of a herpes look alike, uh, you know, lesion. So you see a lot of these small dot. It looks like herpes, but it's not herpes. So that's why the name is break down. So basically the name is just saying that it's this inflammation of the skin. It looks like herpes, but it's not herpes, okay? So, so, I, that's, so you break it down to help you remember it, okay? Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about this one, all right? So like example, uh, so you see this cold sore right here? There, that's a cold sore. So it looks like a bunch of small vesicle uh, in the middle, uh, and it, it looked kind of similar to this one, but this one is a little bit more severe. Uh, but they have similar you know, characteristics, so that's why the name it tells you that somebody thought that it was probably herpes, but it's not, okay? Uh, so uh, the main thing about dermatitis herpetiformis is you have to remember that it's an autoimmune reaction to dietary gluten. Uh, so that means it's associated with the celiac disease. So on the step one, if they show you this one and they tell you the patient has some sort of diarrhea, uh, you know, uh, then you think about the dermatitis herpetiformis. It's not cold sore. Uh, so it's the uh, presentation is very similar to the herpes. So it's very pretty and you know, it's very itchy. Uh, and it's, it'll have a lot of vesicle uh, on the inside. And usually it's a curve in groups. Uh, so in groups and clusters. So that's why they call it a formis. Formis means like a formation, right? So you need a group or a cluster of things to form it. Uh, to, to form it. So uh, the way you differentiate it by the skin biopsy. And the only thing you need to know is that uh, you will show that it's a micro abscesses at the tip of the dermal of the papillae. So remember the uh, dermis have two layers, right? So one layer we have like this, this right here, this finger light projection. That's why we call it it's a papillary, uh, uh, you know, layer. So this is a papillary layer, layer right here. And you would have this micro abscess at the, pap like the dermal papillae. So this is a, the part that has become uh, blister. And you have to remember celiac disease means that it's IgA related, okay? Uh, so usually people, uh, how to treat it, uh, the same thing, how you treat celiac disease, because it's a dietary thing, a dietary problem. You would tell the patient to stop eating, uh, uh, you know, anything that have gluten. So the diet have to be gluten-free diet. However, if a patient come in with acute symptoms, right, uh, you know, with acute flare of diarrhea, so you need to give them Dapso. Uh, so basically it's an anti-inflammatory. Uh, kind of like steroid and they sort of, you know, help with the acute uh, uh, episode of the, uh, you know, uh, the flare. Uh, 
so that is to help with that. Okay, so remember the name. Dermatitis is just inflammation. Herpetiformis means that it looks like herpes, uh, but it's not herpes. Okay. All right. So the next one will arrhythmia multiform. Uh, so, have, do you want to do you know the difference between the three? Oh, I have not learned about this yet. Okay. So I will talk to you Sorry. about the uh, three. So. The three uh, conditions for me is like a spectrum uh, of disorders, okay? So uh, you don't have to remember everything. Just remember that one will lead to the other and it will become more severe and severe. And remember, uh, Stephen John syndrome and the toxic epidermal necrolysis are, you know, uh, emergency. So if you see this, that means the patient needs to be, you know, uh, taken care of seriously and you have to call the surgical team consult and the dermatology uh, to sort of help uh, uh, managing the patient if these patients are in trouble. Okay, so the first thing you need to know is that the arrhythmia multiform, uh, basically that is just have less than 10% of the total TB's SA, I mean that's a total body surface area. Uh, that means that it's less than 10%, and this is the most uh, minor form. It's not, it's not serious. All, all it does is that because the patient maybe takes some drugs and it becomes an allergic reaction to it. So most of it is caused by allergic reactions. So some of the common drugs that we talk about is allopurinol, uh, you know, treat gout, and then we have antibiotics, mostly it's sulfur drugs. And the most important one is the anticonvulsant. Uh, a lot of them are, uh, you know, can cause a skin reaction. So we talk about the lamotrigine, uh, phenytoin, carbamazepine, okay? Uh, and the characteristic of the arrhythmia multiform is that it's this target-like lesion. So target, so uh, when you talk about target, it's like this one. It's a target in the middle where people, you know, shoot an arrow to it. So you look at it, it looks like a round circle area. And then in the middle, it have a central clearing. So that's why they call it a target lesion. Okay. And most of this symptom, most of this problem will have oral lesion, meaning that it will involve the mouth and the area around the mouth. Uh, but just remember that uh, the, so the first thing you remember is a target lesion in that arrhythmia multiform, okay? And when you talk about Steven Johnson syndrome and you talk about toxic uh, epidermal necrolysis, the only difference between the two is that the to total body surface area. Uh, so if you have more than 30%, that means that the patient is in trouble. Uh, they have toxic epidermal necrolysis. So look at the name, necrolysis. What does necrolysis mean? It's basically the skin that's dying and it's sloughing off. So that's why it's severe. Okay, so this one, if you put your thing, if you touch your hand to the skin, the skin will slough off. So that's why it has positive uh, Nikoski sign. And remember, you have to admit this patient to the burn center and you make sure that, you know, you cause surgery to the Brits, uh, all this uh, skin, dead skin. Why? Because, you know, something is dead, so it becomes uh, like a breeding ground for bacteria. So these patients are at an increase in risk of getting uh, bacterial infections, and these are serious. If they become sepsis, uh, they will they will die quickly. So you have to take care of you know immediately. And then the Steven Johnson syndrome. Uh, the only difference is that the uh, body surface is ten percent, so less than ten percent. And usually, mostly uh, it occurs in children, and uh, or it could be you know drug reactions. Uh, but uh, you know usually they have more than two mucosocytes, so it could be. Uh, the uh, the mouth, the lips, and it also somewhere in the skin. Uh, but this one is a little bit less severe, but still uh, could progress into uh, toxic epidermal ne uh, necrolysis. So again, Stephen Johnson syndrome can actually progress into uh, TEN. So the short term for it is a TEN. So make sure you pay attention to it. Okay. So less than ten percent, then you think about Stephen Johnson syndrome. More than thirty percent, you think about toxic epidermal necrolysis, and pay attention to the drugs can cause the states this, uh, you know, skin reactions, okay? Uh, so, we go to the next one. All right, so skin cancer. Uh, now we can talk about the most common skin cancer and we talk about the pre-malignant skin cancer uh, and we can walk through one by one. All right, so first one is the pre-malignant lesions. Uh, so I, I use, uh, I'm in, uh, uh, you know, a dictionary to translate it to, uh, to English. Uh, so the first one is actinic keratosis. This one you see very often in uh, clinics. Uh, you know, a lot of old people, old folks will have this. And why do old folks have it, not young people? Because old folks, they are, 
uh, at increasing risk because they're exposed to sun uh, more often than young people. Uh, so that's why they have the excess of the keratin, and then it look it looks like a like a scaly uh, skin flakes, uh, and but sometimes uh, it can bleed, and so that's why uh, you sort of have to pay attention to it. Uh, because it can actually become cancer uh, because of pre-malignant lesion. So, uh, so the common affected area is any area that exposes to the sun. Uh, so you think about the face, the ear, the scalp, the dorsal, the arms, or the hands. And the characteristic um, way you describe it is to look like a sandpaper uh, consistency. So this is a sandpaper right here. So you know, like yin yang, uh, you know, like to to scrape off the the um, uh, uh, you know the uh, what do you call the paint? Uh, it looks like that. It looks like a sandpaper consistency. So just remember that. Uh, and then uh, how you diagnose this? Usually you see old folks and you see this old skin flakes. Then you can sort of say it's you know actinic keratosis. Uh, most people don't do a skin biopsy for it because usually it's just very minor symptoms. Uh, some people can do uh, fluorouracil cream. Some people can actually. Uh, Look at nitrogen cryotherapy. Uh, so cryo, cryo means it's cold. So they use uh, you know liquid nitrogen and they freeze off that uh, that that area. So over here they would take liquid nitrogen and they freeze off this uh, this this area right here and with you know it sort of kill all the uh, all the cell underneath, including the melanocyte. So that's how you usually treat it. So make sure you remember the characteristic of it. Okay. So it looks scaly. It looks like sandpaper consistency, and mostly you see it in old folks. Right. All right, so the other one is a little bit more severe. Uh, so we have this is keratoka acanthoma. Uh, so this one is a precursor to this uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So if you look at the skin, uh, most of the premalignant lesion will become squamous cell carcinoma. You don't have a lot of uh, premalignant lesion that become a basal cell carcinoma. So that's one of the tricks you should remember. Most of the premalignant will become a squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. So uh, the, it looks like, look, look at this, it looks like a volcano-like nodule. Uh, and this one may regress spontaneously, uh, but can actually it can differentiate into squamous cell carcinoma, okay? And the early uh, treatment is indicated if there, you know, is an important structure next to it. Like if there's an eye next to it, then you should treat it. If not, then you just leave it alone. Uh, usually you don't have to treat it. All right, so now we can talk about skin cancer, uh, which is very common and I, I, I sort of, you know, so in real life, uh, sometimes the skin lesion will look very difficult. To, uh, you, know, you cannot tell whether it's squamous cell carcinoma or a basal cell carcinoma, but the only uh, thing that can help you differentiate between the two is you can do a skin biopsy, okay? And the difference is that you have to know what kind of skin biopsy you should do, uh, okay? So there is many, uh, form of skin biopsy that you can do, okay? Uh, so the first one is squamous cell carcinoma. So skin cancer in a big umbrella, anything that can have damage to the skin can cause skin cancer. So UV light, you know, tanning salon, uh, so uh, any uh, chronic, uh, you know, damage to the skin. So for example, if you have chronic burn or wound, uh, then can cause a squamous cell carcinoma. So what I want you to remember that, say so UV light, sunlight, anything can cause a skin cancer. Uh, one of the important thing is that if a patient come into your uh, clinics, right, and they have this lesion, let's say this lesion on the, uh, on the right right here, and you, you, know, you treated it and it never go away, it keep coming back, coming back. Uh, so, uh, you know, and they will ask you, uh, so what do you think the, uh, you know, the, the diagnosis is? Then you think about Magellan ulcer, so this is way muscle cell carcinoma. So, if squamous cell carcinoma arises from the chronic burn or wound, then you call it uh, Magellan ulcer. So there's a special name for it, okay? So just remember that if a patient has an ulcer that never go away, then you should do a biopsy to make sure that's not a squamous cell carcinoma or a, a squamous cell cancer, all right? So remember that. And remember the other thing, a fair skin tone. So, uh, you know, people, uh, albino people, uh, they don't have a lot of, uh, you know, melanin to protect this uh, the UV light damage then they are at higher risk for uh, skin cancer, uh, okay? So on step one, you need to know how to differentiate between the two, uh, squamous cell versus basal cell carcinoma because it's very characteristic. Uh, so for squamous cell, then you should think about uh, ulceration. So ulceration is a, you know, is a key feature for 
squamous cell carcinoma. So we have bleeding and ulceration. Uh, then you think about squamous cell carcinoma. And again, uh, if you don't know, then you do a skin biopsy. And how do you tell the uh, skin biopsy is a basal cell carcinoma versus uh, squamous cell carcinoma? Uh, squamous cell or squamous cells, like squamous cells. So they have keratin pearl. So the little uh, pinkish pearl right here is called a keratin pearl. So if you see that on the exam, it's a pathomimonic for uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And how do you treat uh, squamous cell carcinoma? Uh, it's very easy. Uh, this is not very uh, highly uh, malignant because uh, most of the time you can treat it, you can uh, cure it. So uh, the good thing is that it's 90% is curative. Okay, so how do you treat it? So it depends on the lesion. You know, where is the lesion? So let's say if it's a small lesion and it's on a, you know, surface of the body, on like the arm uh, or even on the forehead or on the leg, uh, what you need to do is you just, you know, either you, you surgically remove it. So you just, you know, take a scalpel and uh, sort of, you know, get rid of it, uh, then it will go away. Uh, and uh, the second thing is you, you can do the same thing. You can do cryotherapy. Uh, you use liquid nitrogen and you freeze it off, okay, and you kill all the cancer cells. And electrodesiccant, uh, you know, I can talk a little bit. Basically, you just use, uh, you know, electric, uh, electricity to burn off the, uh, the skin lesion. Uh, but the other thing I want you guys to remember is that if it's on a very sensitive area, for example, it's on the face or it's on the genital uh, area, like at the penis or the vulva regions, these are very sensitive area, right? You don't want to, uh, you know, stick, you know, a, a scalpel and just take it off in the face because cosmetically it doesn't look nice. So that's why you need to use a form of uh, a surgery called the Mohs surgery. Uh, so this is very famous, uh, Mohs surgery, okay? Uh, so, so this is how Mohs surgery is performed, okay? So, so normally, if you have a lesion, you go see the doctor and they take the scalpel, they, they, you know, they can do a scalpel, they remove it, and they're just one time and you're done, all right? Or so curettage is basically, you can just remove it, you just take a curette, and you remove the, the area. And electro desiccation is the same thing. Uh, you know, you use electricity and you burn off the area. So one appointment and you're done, right? But with most surgery, it's more complicated. It's contain multiple, multiple procedures. So each time you go to visit a, lay, a doctor office, uh, they will take a, you know, a layer of the skin. They will take one layer, right? And then they will look under the microscope to make sure that, you know, uh, it's, it's contained, it's a clear margin. There's no more uh, cancer in, in, within that area. But if, you know, there's still more cancer, then, you know, the patient has to come back to the doctor's office and they take another layer again, right? So they keep taking more and more layer until it gets to the, uh, you know, the cancer uh, layer and until there's no, the, the free, there's no more uh, free margin. So that's why uh, you, some patients that end up going back to the doctor like two, three times until they, you know, they, they're, uh, uh, biopsy is completely clean, okay? So it's a little bit more extensive, it's expensive, uh, uh, and it's more work, uh, but cosmetically, it helps, it, you know, it's helped prevent the scar, and it doesn't look bad uh, on the, you know, sensitive areas, such as the face. Uh, you want to preserve as much as the uh, structures uh, compared to, like, anywhere in the other body, like this, uh, like the leg or the arm, just take it off, okay? So make sure if you see a cancer on the face, you do a mole surgery. All right, so the next one, a basal cell carcinoma. I'll say this one is a basal cell. So remember, basal cell means that it's a deeper layer, right? Uh, so uh, again, uh, same thing, it's a chronic sun exposure uh, that causes basal cell carcinoma. Uh, but uh, if you think about, uh, you know, characteristic that differentiate between this basal versus squamous, uh, think about uh, this, this, this phrase right here. It's a pearly papio. Uh, so remember, papio is the elevated, right? You can see the skin is elevated over here. It's not flat because it's, uh, it's at the basal cell, so it push up the skin, so it become like a, you know, like a flat. So that's why they call it a uh, pearly papio with telangiectasia. So telangiectasia means that it's the new formation of the blood vessel. So that's why you have this uh, skin. Uh, so if you zoom in, you will see a lot more of the blood vessel. So you can see right here, blood vessel, blood vessel, blood vessel, okay? Uh, and remember, that is, uh, it could be elevated border with central ulceration. Oh, and I also forget to tell you guys that if the scanser is involved on the lips, uh, you should remember that 
if the lips uh, is upper lips, then it's, um, think about the uh, you know basal cell. And if it's a lower lip, then you think about the squamous cell carcinoma. Very important, okay? So this is a lip right here. All right, so upper lip, then you think about basal cell. Lower lip, then you think about squamous cell. So one of the mnemonic uh, that you know uh, that I remember is that they call it you know the lips when you talk about the lips, right? People swear that's why they call you know there's no bullshit. So BS, B is basal, which is on the top. S is the the you know like squamous cell, which is at the bottom. Okay. So remember that if they show you a tumor on the lips, on the top the basal at the bottom will be squamous cell. Uh, again, you do a skin biopsy, but this one uh, the characteristic is that they call this uh, spindle cells with the palisading a palisading basal cell. Look at how these cells are. They palisade in, in that they's on like on the like on on the uh, peripheral. It just you know like palisade in, like like that. Okay. So if they show you the pictures, it look like this, and it's basal cell carcinoma. And the treatment is very complicated. It depends on the location, and it also depends on whether there is a low risk or high risk. Uh, but you know, again, uh, there's many uh, options you can do. Uh, you can do the curettage, uh, you know, electro desiccation. Uh, you can use uh, medication like, you know, 5 or uroso or imiquidol, uh, or you can also do the mold surgery. Okay, so if you want to read, you can read about that. Step one will not ask you for treatment for these cancers. Okay, yeah, they can only tell you, uh, test you how to differentiate between the two. Uh, so just know the characteristic uh, of the one. All right, now we talk about melanoma. Make sure you know melanoma, okay, because melanoma is always tested on the exam. Uh, so how do you remember melanoma? I think everyone knows what melanoma is. So basically, it looks like a mole, but it looks, you know, dysplastic. It doesn't look like a normal mole. Uh, so nevi, nevi is a, a, a mole. Uh, basically, it's another name for mole. Okay, so how do you remember that? So uh, A, B, C, D, E, that's how we talk to uh, differentiate. Uh, melanoma versus this uh, regular uh, uh, mole. Uh, so first A means the asymmetry. So if you look at the, this right here, it doesn't look symmetrical, right? There's no way you can tell this one is the same as this one. And the border, look at how irregular the border is. So irregular border. And then C, which is color. Look at how different colors. This is black, this is like brown, and this is like, you know, white. So it's not Consistency, they have different colors, uh, and sometimes it can also bleed too, uh, and then will be like red. And then we have D, which is diameter, which is more than six. I think this one, they don't test you that much. You know, they don't, they're not going to tell you, is, uh, you know, it's, it's, this is, they will tell you whether it's more than six uh, or not. And evolution means that changing over time, okay? So sometimes a patient will come in with a mole, it look completely black, and then over time it start bleeding and they start to grow out, you know, and then they have a different colors and you think about melanoma, okay? So the most important thing I want you guys to remember is the skin biopsy. All right, so I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Hong Vu, if someone comes in with a melanoma, do you do a shave biopsy? You know what's different between, between the shave biopsy versus excisional biopsy? Have you seen anyone do a biopsy for the skin? No, no, I don't see anything. Any okay. To okay. Service. All right. So uh, let me ask you, have you eat any uh, shave cream, ice cream? You know, like the uh, Korean, like, you know, like when people a long time ago, when they shave the ice off, you know yeah. what I'm talking about, right? So that's exactly what a shave biopsy. They just shave off just layer of the skin. If you think of someone have melanoma, why can you not? Why why can you not do the shave biopsy? Why do you have to take out the the skin? Because it's maybe maybe spread out the, the cancer to another application by mm. uh, the the technique of uh, biopsy. Mm, okay, not, that's not really exactly the reason. Okay, hip, do you know why that we don't do shave biopsy? I have no idea. Okay. All right, so uh, Tuta, how do you know, you know why? why? Why can't you just shave it off and send it to the lab? Why do you have to go in and cut it out? And why do you have to do that? What's the difference? Mm, maybe it's painful. Painful? Okay, yeah. I mean, you know, like usually we, we give patients like, you know, a numbing medication so they don't feel anything. Oh, okay. Okay. 
All right, so there's another reason for it, but I want to test you guys. Okay, let's see, uh, Donnie, I think there's a new person. Hi, Dory. Hello. Hi, are you new? Hi, uh, I'm hi. Hi. Uh, I think uh, the reason is uh, it will make the patient is uh, with bleeding risk. Bleeding? Okay, well, uh, like I say, uh, sometimes we give them the patient like epinephrine uh, and also uh, uh, lidocaine, so that will reduce the risk of bleeding. So that's not really the, the reason why. So step one will ask you this. So that's why I, I wanted to make sure you guys understand this, okay? So when it comes to melanoma, the most important thing is how deep is the cancer, okay? So if the surface if the cancer has not invaded into the basal area, that the deeper it goes, the more dangerous it is. Because melanoma. Oh, I okay. All right, Hip, you want to answer that? I, I guess it has something to do with the metastasize. Okay, but so why do we. So, what's the difference when you do a shade biopsy versus excisional biopsy? Okay. All right, so let's, let, let me draw this, okay? So this is a skin, right? It has multiple layer, okay? So melanoma is basically, is a skin of the cancer of the melanocyte, right? So remember the melanocyte, which is what layer is a melanocyte? It's at the basal layer, right? Okay, so it depends on how deep the cancer go. So the, the cancer will spread down, you know, into the deepest layer and then it will metastasize. So, the most important proxenetic factors mean that how likely the patient will survive depend how deep the, the layer, how deep the cancer is, okay? So the deeper it goes, the more dangerous the cancer is. So that's why you wanna, sh you know, take out the whole thing, okay? You don't wanna shave the, shave the skin. So what if you shave the skin, you only get this part and you leave this part over here, you know? So you don't get the whole skin. So you, you wanna get the whole, uh, skin out, the whole lesion out. You don't want to shave just a little bit because you don't know how deep it goes, okay? So that's why if you think someone have melanoma, you want to go in there and you take out as deep as you can, okay? So you don't take out just the top surface uh, because like again, the depth of this cancer will tell you how good the patient will recover uh, from the cancer, okay? Uh, so remember this, for Swamer cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma, you can do a shave biopsy, you know, if you want. You can do a punch biopsy if you want, okay? But for uh, melanoma, you definitely want to know how deep the cancer is. So you have to do an exc excisional biopsy. So that's the only difference that I want you guys to remember that. That's a very high yield, uh, you know, test question, all right? So remember, melanocyte is a cancer of the melanin. So that's why you see it's so dark disease. So, all this is a melanin, all right? So make sure you know the reason why we don't do a shea biopsy for uh, melanoma. Hmm? Oh. Sorry, my computer is slow. Oh. All right, so again, so I want people to know uh, Right here, so superficial, and also there are four types of melanoma, uh, so you should know about these. Um, not, they usually test you uh, just one thing, but I just wanna run through four of them, okay? So again, superficial uh, mean that it's just on the surface, so it should be flat, and it just look, you know, black and brown. But again, if you do A, B, C, D, E, you, you can tell that, right, uh, this is a melanoma because it have different colors, okay? But it maybe look it looks symmetrical, but the color is very totally different. Uh, so, but and it also uh, bigger than six uh, millimeters. So that's why you think it's melanoma. All right. So this is superficial. That means that is flat. Okay. Uh, and they have the nodular melanoma. It's a nodule. Uh, so that's why it's usually look like a nodule. And the the, the other two that you need to know is lentigo and acro lentiginous uh, melanoma. So uh, acro. Uh, if you break down the word acro, it just means that it's on the palm and the sole. Uh, so if you look uh, under the, uh, uh, the patient uh, feet and also on the palm of the sole, and you have this uh, dark lesion right here, it looks like melanoma, 
than is acral antigenous uh, melanoma. Uh, and usually one of the other thing is most commonly found in African-American people. So uh, just remember that. And the other one is lentigo maligna melanoma. Uh, basically it's commonly on the face and neck and the arm. And it's just a large uh, flat and a tan area of brown. And it usually occurs in older skin type. So just remember the acral lenticulous melanoma is occur at the soles uh, of the, uh, the feet and also the palms. Uh, these are two different, you know, characteristic of melanoma. Uh, so that's all you should know about melanoma. All right, so again, this is A, B, C, D, E. Uh, I just want to tell you different between the benign and the malignant. So look at the benign one. Look at that mole. Uh, it looks magical. Uh, the borders are even and then they have just one color and usually a smaller than six millimeter and it looks just like an ordinary mole and malignant look at that this asymmetric as doesn't look symmetrical the border are uneven and then you have the colors are different you have black you have white uh, you sometimes bleeding it's larger than six millimeter and this is melanoma and again if you think a patient have melanoma you need to do an excisional biopsy you do not do a shape biopsy all right, so now we can go ahead with the commonly tested skin disorders. So these are very similar, uh, simple question, easy point, okay? So uh, they're gonna show you a pictures and you know what it is. Again, so we talk about the uh, most common one is cherry hemangioma and strawberry hemangioma. Again, these are uh, vascular tumors. So vascular in that it has to do with the blood vessel, okay? Uh, so that's why these are red. It's red because of the blood vessel. It's a, uh, it's a tumor of the blood vessel, so that's why it's red. And when you talk about cherry, so uh, when you, if anyone have eaten cherry, and you know, in Vietnam, I think people start eating cherry now. When I, I was living there, we have no idea what cherry means. Uh, but now people start eating it. So a cherry, it looks like this, and a strawberry, it looks like this. So when you compare the size of the cherry, it's smaller than the strawberry, okay? So the first thing I want to tell you that cherry hemangioma is very small. It looks a little bit small, it's mostly, they call it senile angioma because commonly in adults. So you're gonna see a lot of adults walking around that they have like little red mark look like this. Then it's just a cherry hemangioma. It's always cutaneous, uh, okay? So it's always on the surface and it do not regress spontaneously, meaning that it will remain there for forever. Uh, so, uh, you, and usually you don't do anything. It, you just tell them that it's a, just a normal uh, you know, explosion of the skin, uh, of the, the blood vessels, but it just stay there. It doesn't do anything. It's not cancer either. And then you talk about strawberry. Strawberry is bigger. So look at how big this thing is. It looks like a big, humongous, like tumor. Uh, and it's mostly commonly seen in children. Okay, so that's the difference between the one. So cherry means it's in adult. Strawberry is in the children. And it occurs mostly in deep tissue. Okay, so it's in deep tissue. So it's not on the surface, it's on the deep tissue. So that's why it's a little bit more elevated than the uh, cherry hemangioma. And the, the funny thing that you need to know about this one is that initially it will grow really fast for a couple of years, okay? And then it regressed spontaneously. So if a patient come in with a kid and they have this humongous strawberry hemangioma, you explain to the patient, you say, this is a normal thing, okay? It's a blood vessel, it's prolifer uh, proliferated, you know, aggressively during the first couple of years and then uh, spontaneously by the age, you know, by five to eight, it starts to disappear uh, so that the patient, you know, they feel, uh, they don't feel bad about it, okay? And again, you don't do anything. Uh, it's the kid. You, you don't want to do any surgery for them. Uh, you just let it grow and then we'll, it will resolve by itself, okay? So make sure you remember this it's cherry hemangioma versus strawberry hemangioma. This is some time tested too, so make sure you know. And the other uh, skin disorder that I want you guys to know is the acanthosis nigricans, okay? So these are basically, it's a black, basically it's a darker, uh, uh, you know, skin. So, and they have this velvety, you know, classic velvety structures. Uh, and what significant thing about this one is that it tells that the patient have insulin resistance, uh, basically diabetes. Uh, so, if they tell you, they show you the picture of this and they tell you which of the condition is associated, you, know, you think about insulin resistant or diabetes. Uh, so this is what I'm talking about. So what's the area usually you find it? It's usually in the armpit. Any, any skin fold, uh, it was, you will see this dark uh, velvety uh, texture. So it's uh, in the back of your neck, okay? Or it could be on the neck too. Uh, and it's mostly uh, a lot of African-American people uh, also, patients also have this and it's easier to see. 
okay? And the second thing that I want you guys to know is seborrheic keratosis. This is very, very common. A lot of old people, so like all, most of the skin disorder are found in old people, okay? Because they old, so you know, like they, you can find multiple things, uh, but most of them are common and normal. So you don't, you know, so you explain to them so they don't freak out. So the seborrheic keratosis, what it looks like, it looks waxy and it looks like a stuck on appearance. So it looks like a wart, uh, just stuck on the patient's skin. Like you feel like you could scrape it off, right? But it doesn't scrape off. Uh, you can actually cause bleeding. Sometimes people uh, come in with bleeding because they try to scratch it off, but it doesn't scratch off. But it just looked like a wart. It looked like a waxy stuck on appearance, okay? Sometimes it can be very itchy. Sometimes it's tender. Just tell the patient it's just seborrheic keratosis. Uh, so remember the keratosis, that means the keratin, okay? So they just have excessive keratin. Uh, so that's like, it looked like thick and like dry skin, dry uh, mostly in advanced age, like old people. Again, no therapy is needed. Uh, and you just tell the patient that, you know, it's a normal thing that associate with uh, old, older age. All right, so the third one is the keloids. Uh, keloid is basically uh, a normal response of the body. Not, I wouldn't say normal, it's an in, uh, abnormal response of the body against, a, uh, um, you know, a, uh, uh, injury to the skin. So usually if you have like a cut on the skin, you just form like a little scar, but for some reason, this is like excessive scar. So it just scar you on scar. So that's, that's why it looks like a keloid. So you don't call it a scar anymore, you call it a keloid because now you have a thickened skin, basically just scar, uh, just extra scar. Uh, and sometimes they treat with a glucocorticoid uh, because this uh, could be like inflammatory response. So that's why you use steroid to like dampen down the response, okay? And the last, the, the uh, next thing is arrhythmia nodosum. Uh, so remember that break down the name, okay? So arrhythmia, arrhythmia means it's just redness, okay? So this means it's redness. And uh, nodosum, so no, nodosum is like a note, all right? So it looks like a note. So mostly you will see on the shin, uh, it's always on the anterior shin. So look at this one, it looks like a note. It's a red note. Uh, so they cause arrhythmia nodosum. Uh, so what's important about this skin condition is that it's associated with a couple of things that you need to remember. Psychodosis, that's one of them. African-American, young female, could be a young guy, uh, come in with sort of like pulmonary symptom, uh, trouble breathing, uh, you know, uh, then you think about, and then they have this skin lesion, then you think about psychodosis. Someone come in with diarrhea, excessive diarrhea, young person, then you think about inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and they always have this arrhythmia nodosum, which is a characteristic uh, of the disease, okay? So make sure you remember that. And number five, this one, my mother actually has this, so I know this very well. Uh, so basically, this is basically, it's a bunch of multiple uh, seborrheic keratosis. So if you see, it's usually on the back of the, uh, uh, on, the uh, on the back. So you see that they have multiple, multiple seborrheic keratosis. Then you think that the patient might have some sort of internal malignancy. Uh, again, it sort of has to do with the hormone, something change in the hormone and the stimulate the melanocyte to produce a small melanin. Uh, but the most common associated cancer is the GI cancer. Uh, so my mother had colorectal cancer, so that's, that's what she had. Uh, but mostly it could be any GI source. So it could be stomach, it could be liver, it could be the pancreas. Uh, Sometimes it could be breast or lung cancer. Uh, but uh, again, if you see, Anyone, uh, any patient that come in with a lot of, uh, you know, this sign in the back, then you call less uh, lesser trilateral sign. So you look for the uh, cancer, okay? The patient might have some sort of underlying cancer. All right, uh, so that's a long uh, lecture, uh, basically, because there's so many things that, you know, uh, have to go with the uh, skin disorders, uh, but most of them, you just have to know what it looks like. Uh, and look, know what the associated uh, condition that associated with it. All right, so we're going to do some uh, quick uh, test, okay? All right, so the first questions. So uh, the lesion below developed on the infant several weeks after birth. Uh, which of the following is true? All right, so I'm going to have uh, Hong Vo, you want to take the first uh, question? Uh. Okay, first of all, what is the name of that um, lesion? I think it's strawberry uh, uh, hemangioma. Great job. So it's a strawberry. And how do you know it's a strawberry? Because it's happened in uh, children. Exactly. So in children, right? 
Okay, so it's, does it occur in deep tissue or in superficial tissue? Yeah, it, it occurs in superficial tissue. No, uh, superficial is usually in old people, right? So look uh, how look how raised it is. It looks like it's like a, a notch, like it's look like a pap field, like a plaque, uh, not a plaque, right? It's look like a um, what do you call it, like elevated, uh, right? So it should be having deep, it's a deep uh, lesion. So yeah. again, remember a strawberry is, uh, you know, a children and it's uh, deep and cherry is in old people and it's usually uh, superficial. Okay. All right. So what do you think? Let's say bleeding is the most common complication. So when it's really deep, so where is the blood vessel in the skin? What layer is the blood vessel? Uh, so we have, so we have epidermis. We have dermis and hypodermis. What layer have the uh, uh, have the uh, uh, blood vessel? I think in dermis. In the dermis, great. So this is where the blood vessel, right? All the connective tissue. All right. So is that a deep layer or is that a superficial layer? If it's in the dermis. Dermis is deep. Okay, so deep. So do you think that it would bleed? Uh, I, I have seen it, but uh, I don't see it bleed. Okay, yeah. yeah. So bleeding is not really common, right? So, so when you say deep, it usually they, they talk about like hypodermis. Um, so if usually if, if it's not bleeding, that means that it's super, probably it's superficial. So if things are a little bit superficial, that's why it's deep. Like remember when you cut your hand, right? You have to cut a little bit deep in order to cause bleeding to occur, right? So if you just do like a, a you know like if you do just a, you you cut your 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 finger on the top just a little bit, then you already see your skin is bleeding already. So bleeding is mostly a superficial problem. It's not a deep problem. Okay, so this is you're right. This is strawberry. Um, so it's a curve in the children and it's a curve with deep tissue. So. Bleeding, um, so B is wrong, okay? And does it occur in more commonly in female versus males? No. Okay, so that's one is wrong too. I don't know what C is. All right, so yeah. what tell you? So what is a characteristic of the strawberry? Does it uh, sort of go away quickly or does it, you know, it's remain for life? No, it will um, progress quickly for the first okay. one or so, two years. And regret. Yeah. So grow, grow quickly and then it regress, right? Yes. So this is what happened. So uh, so the, the correct answer is E, you know, the color changes. So it changes the color as it grows, but then it will reg regress, uh, you know, after that. Okay, so that, so the, the answer is color changes from deep red to gray purple. And then um, you see the early sign of sort of, you know, uh, involution for them. All right, so, so the color change. All right, so let's see question number two. I'm gonna have uh, Su Tao, you wanna give us a, uh, give it a crack? Yes. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. I um, guess this lesson, but I have mm -hmm. no idea. You have no idea? I think, okay. I think, nice. I, ju I just, and yes, I just guess it's um, uh, the yeah. miss her the miss her kiss uh, from formation. Oh, whoa! Okay, so let let go back. Okay, so what do you say? So you think this is uh, dermatitis? Dermatitis. Her hepatiformis. Yeah. Ah, okay, I can't even spell it. So hepatiformis, right? Okay, what make you say that? Mm, I think I see some uh, lesion like uh, mm -hmm. so lesion like elevated uh, okay. elevated yeah. okay so you think look like a herpes uh, lesion right yeah what if I tell you that is lesion is look at the dermatome is follow as a dermatome all right and mm -hmm. it usually people feel uh, tingly and then it become painful tingling and then become painful. You actually told me that before. So what other, uh, what other conditions are associated with herpes? 
What other mm. condition that can herpes virus cause? So herpes? Painful. Yeah, so remember what I tell you, herpes? Have you seen herpes? What other, what other condition that you can see at herpes? Cold sores. Mm. Cold sores, okay, good. Yes. Yeah, that's on the lips, right? Mostly on the lips. Yes. Okay, so this is the lips. Okay, what else? You told me that before. You, you told me the condition before. Um, um, chicken pox and chicken. Uh, shingles. Shingles, okay. Have you seen anyone with shingles? Chicken pox is yes. eradicated, Man. okay? Man. Chicken pox I is... see many people with shingles. Shingle, okay. So does that look like shingle mm -hmm. to you? No. Really? <laughs> That's actually uh, shingles. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because uh, it's only in one side. Yeah. So, okay. So you're right. Shingle can usually on one side, right? And it's mm -hmm. um, it's usually it should be only on one side. And if we follow a dermatome, but sometimes they actually can be on both sides. It's different dermatome. Oh. Okay. So some severe symptoms can actually have both sides. But again, um, you know, if the if you see the lesion, it looks like dots, you know, like, like herpes, like little dots that form together, then you think about, uh, you know, shingle. Uh, so, so this is shingle. So how do you treat shingles? Uh, I, by acyclovir. Acyclovir, okay. Uh, and what else? What is acyclovir? What, what is acyclovir? What kind of drug is it? Um, it's the an an antivirus. Okay, so antivirus. Okay, so antiviral. Okay, so what would you choose? There's no acyclovir here. Maybe D is my answer. Okay, you are absolutely correct. Okay, so femcyclovir <laughs> and acyclovir is the same uh, class of drugs. So that's why, okay. Yeah. Uh, All right, so let me go ask you this. How about A, prednisone? Uh, what, how, what, what condition would you you know, prescribe that for? Mm, sorry, I, I don't know okay, the so, question. Yeah, so let's say, uh, so uh, what condition would you treat with prednisone? Oh, mm, I think the, just some, just some, it is like inflammation. Allergic. Exactly, allergic. inflammation, right? Any inflammation, allergic reaction, right? So, right. What about B and C? These are antibiotics, right? Ah, uh, it's the mm -hmm. infection. Yeah. So these are. But so when you say infection, you have to be more specific, okay? And we are medical professional now. So infection, they have bacterial infection. There's viral infection, yeah. okay? So antibiotic is used for bacterial infections, okay? So these two is bacterial infection. Bacteria. So B, yeah, shingle is also a viral infection, okay? Yeah. yeah. So now you have to be more specific, okay? You can't just say infection anymore. Yes, yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's, you know, as you go higher in the chain, you have to be more specific. All right, my computer. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, let's close. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. It's froze. Uh, okay, I don't know what happened. The, my computer just froze. So. Uh, hey, hey, do you have the slide? Can you open up? Oh, hang on. Let me. Let me go. I got it. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's do the next questions. Uh, so number three. Uh, all right. Let's see, Hip. You're going to do number three. Uh, let me see. Mm -hmm. This is uh, basal, basal cell carcinoma, right? Okay. So it's how you already is basal cell carcinoma and how you treat this. Mm, let me see what I can do. Um, all right. 
let's say uh hoàng vũ what would you say what would you yeah, say? I, uh, i think the lesion in, in the in the face neck. in the neck in the neck mm -hmm. yep lesion is a neck okay so i prefer more mic micrographic surgery all right I, all right i you know i think that's absolutely correct yeah so like i say you know any of the cancer you have to know the location okay it's on the face automatic or the neck any sensitive area uh you know in the neck we have a lot of uh, blood vessel in there and also it's a visual area right when people wear clothes the necks are revealed so you don't want some ugly scar there so you want to make sure that it's cosmetically it looks nice for the patient so that's why you do a most surgery all right so you're absolutely right so that's why you do a most surgery again just remind you that most surgery mean that They keep taking the layer, so it you know until the uh, the margin of cancer is free. All right. All right. So question number four. Um, let's see, Hong Bo, go ahead. Tell me what is this cancer first? Mm -hmm. I think it's not the bacterial infection. <laughs> you think it's bacterial infection? What? No, 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 not, uh, not, okay. not. Okay, it's not bacterial. Okay, all right. So this is not bacterial infection. Okay. okay. Mm. What does it look like to you? All right. So, all right. Let me ask you this. Okay, yeah. if you have to describe the lesion, how would you describe it? If if you describe it to a dermatologist, what do you call this? Is it a macio? Is it a papio? I think it's a papio. Okay, papio. great. So papio. So I agree. You call it a papio, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, squamous cell versus basal. Which one have a papio uh, characteristic? Remember, squamous is what superficial, right? So basal. Basal have a uh, characteristic. Uh, okay. Papio. So remember, always remember, pearly papio is basal. Okay. Okay. So make sure you remember that uh, phrase. So papio means basal. Okay. So this look like a basal cell carcinoma to what me for me. So what is the characteristic of the uh, metastatic rate? Is that you know? So we come down to C and B. Do you think that basal cell metastasizes quickly or is rarely metastasized? Uh, I don't know. Okay, so I'll just tell you, it's, it's rarely metastasized, <coughs> okay? So it's less than 1%, uh, all right? So which one of these cancer are metastasized quickly? Melanoma. Okay, so see that's 20% is melanoma. So they, they metastasize so quickly, so that's why you want to know how deep the cancer is, okay? And squamous cell carcinoma, they have a little bit higher rate of, uh, of you know, uh, metastasize, but it's still less than uh, melanoma. So that's why melanoma is so dangerous. That's why you see a patient with melanoma, you want to take as deep as possible to see how deep is the lesion or the deep of the cancer uh, so that you know you can tell whether they have a good prognostic or not a good prognosis, okay? All right, I mean, that, that's it for um, you know dermatology. And uh, what I want you guys to know is that what it looks like and what condition is associated to, okay? Uh, so I want to go back and tell you uh, Just make sure that you know this associate condition, okay? So the acanthosis nitricans mean that it's insulin resistant, okay? And then if you have arrhythmia nodosum, then you think about uh, inflammatory bowel disease or you think about sacrodosis, okay? And let's, let's start trying, you need to know that because it has some sort of internal malignancy, mostly GI cancer. So make sure you know that. And tell, uh, always study in pairs, all right? So, uh, so that's it for, you know, um, skin cancer and uh, um, uh, dermatology. So you have any questions? Anyone have any questions? So, no? Okay. And what happened to everyone? Like, is it because of uh, close to fit? So that's why no one is attending? We all have two, two students. You guys know what really? happened? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what is going on usually we have at least like seven or eight but today it's just two 
I think it's because of the topic today is the maturity is not really difficult. It's really difficult, but then it's just, you know, very, actually in terms of step one, it's very easy because <laughs> you just have to know what it looks like, okay? You don't have to know anything else. You just have to know what it looks like. Um, dermatology is very interesting. So I think that more people should get familiar with it, especially I want you guys to know like how to describe the lesion, okay? So you cannot say, oh, the patient have a rash or a lesion anymore. Now you have to tell like, oh, the patient have a papio, uh, like, you know, a macbio, uh, like six, seven you know, centimeter or whatever. You have to describe it uh, more specific now. Now that you know the term, okay? Yes. All right, so I think for the next two weeks, I'll be gone, so I won't, the class will be, oh. so for the next three weeks, there's no more classes, uh, unless HIP or, you know, Kato can, uh, uh, you know, uh, continue with the class, uh, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'll be traveling, so I'm not going to have this class, but I think dermatology is very fun uh, to study, uh, so a very easy point on step one, too, so just know it. And I can guarantee you it's very helpful because so many old people come in and they have those cherry hemangioma, actinic keratosis, you know, the seboric keratosis. I'm telling you, you know, you see them, just make sure you go back and exactly look at it and tell them that this is just a normal thing. I see so many times, so that's why I'm telling you it's very common. Okay. All right, so uh, have a good night, everyone. Uh, stay safe. Yes. Um, and, you know, late is coming, so uh, happy new year to everyone. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, all right. Good night. Uh, Hip, thank you uh, for coming. Uh, you are very helpful today. And good job. Uh, I only know a little bit, so yeah. it's, <laughs> it's fine. Uh, you, you, yep. you, know, it's, you know, the more you learn, the, the better you become, okay? Yeah, all right. All right, all right. have a good night, everyone. Good luck with your interview. Yeah, I'm done with my interview already. All right. Yeah, <laughs> so that was my last, so yeah, <laughs> now I can, I can travel and have fun. Okay, all right. Have a good night. All right, see you.